folks welcome to another board game breakfast i hope you had a great easter yesterday welcome to april april fool's day is over at this point which is great because i said it last week that you can't trust anything that comes out um, on april 1st or sometimes even april 2nd and it, there was just all kinds of crazy board game news and in fact during last week we announced that we were adding royals to the dice Tower essentials line and people thought it was an april fool's joke which it's not um so, I don't know, I think fake news announcements are funny sometimes, but they just, it, it's just kind of annoying to use the internet during the week of April 1st. But hey, that's over now, so now we have actual real news to give you. Here you go. From Rio Grande Games, uh, they've announced that they're going to be making a Roll for the Galaxy expansion. Now, hopefully this won't take as long as from when they announced Roll for the Galaxy that came out. Roll for the Galaxy has been doing pretty well for them, apparently, and it's going to have new factions, new dice, new tiles. I'm very excited about that because I'm really loving on Roll for the Galaxy, but we'll see. Dominion Adventures, they've been putting previews up of that all week long, showing the new cards for it. Some of the cards, like new duration cards, the, the cards that act on your turn now and next turn, they were originally introduced in Dominion Seaside. I'm very excited about those. Other of the cards are showing look very convoluted. It looked, I'm still, I, they said that the last Dominion expansion was the last. This one now, we'll have to wait and see, but it will be interesting to see how it works out. Um, I don't know. What do you guys think? Uh, Carcassonne has another mini expansion coming out as a, a, a promo. They're like these double-sided tiles that you can start with at the beginning of the game. They look pretty cool. Um, and I think it will be also released at Essen. We found out that Amon Ray is coming back from Tasty Minstrel. Huzzah! What a good game. And then 504 from Friedman Freeze. Now, 504 is a really fascinating game, and I'm hoping to try to get a chance to play this because essentially what he did was he has nine different modules, and depending what order you put them in depends on what game you're playing. So there's 504 different games in the box. I mean, the modules are things like stocks and, and war, and how does all this fit together? Is this even possible? This is very massive. This is very, I mean, this is like very ambitious project. We'll have to wait and see how that works out. Hey, I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. And we're here for another question of the week. Today's question is from Mark. And he says, what is the one must a two-player game should have? That's a totally open Conflict. question. You think so? Yes. I mean, my favorite two-player games, every, I think every one of my favorite two-player games has conflict, whether it's Summoner Wars or Mage Wars or Twilight Struggle or um, War of the Ring. Every single one of those has conflict. You need conflict for a two-player game to be successful, I believe. See, I was going to say interaction, which is almost the same thing. Interaction, I think, is important because... Uh, there are some two-player games, I think, that you can play by yourself on your own board. There's a lot of games, um, Euro games especially, where you're kind of doing your own thing. And you don't have necessarily conflict in, let's say, Dominion. You can, but you don't have to. No. And that works okay as a two-player game. Race for the Galaxy is not a lot of conflict. No. Unless you play that dumb expansion. Um, so that's a good two-player game. But they're not... Those weren't specifically made as two-player games. Like, when I think of a two-player game, I think of a game that was designed for two players. What about Lost Cities? And Lost Cities, yes, that's a game with no conflict. So there are two-player two games. But here's the thing. I love Lost Cities because I feel like it has a high interaction level. And that's why I said interaction. Because when I am... I'm holding cards so that you can't get them. I'm not just playing cards on my board. I'm looking and saying, if I discard this card, Jason can take it and play it on his side. Yes. Yes. So for me, the most important thing is, is there a heavy amount of interaction? And while conflict can be problematic in a multiplayer game, like three or four, you know, let's all beat up on Jason or, it happens sometimes. or someone else. In a two-player game, the other your opponent expects you to beat up on them, right? Yes. They expect that to happen. Yes, you expect that I'm going to, if you're playing a standard war game, you expect that 
you know, if we're playing We the People and I'm the I'm the British and Tom's the uh, Americans, you expect that he's going to bring George Washington down and I'm going to bring my guys and we're going to push and we're going to we're going to keep pushing and pushing and trying to who can conquer the territory, who can take over Virginia. So you expect that in a two-player game, at least I do in most two-player games, I expect that there's going to be some sort of push and conflict, which is why I think those I rate higher than a game like Lost Cities because I like that in a two-player game because you kind of, you're each trying to push and a lot of them have that asymmetrical thing too, which I think is very... Oh, that's fine. I don't think it's necessary though. But I like the asymmetrical ones. All right. Well, what are you looking for in a two-player game? Tell us in the comments below. Send us your questions at dicetower at gmail.com. Until, dot com, yes. Until next time, <laughs> I'm Tom Vassell. Jason Levine. Hi, Internet. Welcome back to How to Snakes. Uh, in this episode, we're going to talk about one of the major things in a board game cafe, the cafe side of things, drinking. Now, Steven asked me to do this episode because, well... His brain is being eaten by getting ready to relaunch his Kickstarter campaign. Look for that in April. Anyway, uh, we're going to be talking today with Aaron Zach, Director of Operations, because he knows all the stuff about all the drinks. Yay! Drinks! Hey, Mr. Zach! Hey, Wayne. Today, let's talk about some drinks. All right, Wayne. Now, there are three important kinds of drinks to have at a board game cafe, right? There's hot drinks, there's cold drinks, and there's booze. What can you tell me about all three? Well, Wayne, hot drinks, coffee, teas, all those kind of things, very important to the cafe side of things. Um, you're gonna have your classics, your lattes, your cappuccinos. You may mm -hmm. even have flat whites. Oh. oh, I know. Those are very trendy these days. Uh, you're gonna have some good equipment to do that. You know, you're gonna invest in a good quality coffee machine, good grinders, and staff training for that. Um, cold drinks, smoothies, things like that, they're kind of seasonal. Uh, you'll do better in the summer, iced coffees, that kind of stuff. Also important, but I think you can't overlook booze. Tell me more about booze. I like booze. Well, here at Snakes and Lattes, we focus on craft beer. Uh, we think that having uh, two industries, you know, board games and craft beer, they're growing really rapidly together. They both have a lot of passion. It's really, it's a really great combination. Uh, you're gonna. A lot of people love games. A lot of people love beer. Uh, alongside that, you're gonna have your wines and your cocktails, things like that, and those kind of choices are gonna come out of your own experiences and what you like. That's the best way to do it. Anyway, thanks for taking the time to talk with me. Bye-bye, Internet! Aye, that I did, but I gotta tell you, I brought something a little bit extra just to give you a sample. For example, let's uh, just look at this. It's just. Mmm. That's so. Mmm. Mmm. Do you wow. think you could bribe me with food, sir? Aye, that I do. <laughs> it's so good. <laughs> It worked! <laughs> oh, 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 this is it! Get your grubby hands off of this! <laughs> but, I do have to say, Sheriff, that I fooled you. Uh, they fooled me! Yeah, who cares?
coming out for today's hour this week? Well, I'll tell you one thing that's not coming out, and that's episode 401. Uh, we don't often take breaks in our audio podcast, put one out every week, but after episode 400, we thought we'd take a break of one week. So there's no Dice Tower podcast, but there's plenty of other Dice Tower stuff. You can check all that out on Dice Tower Network uh, or the new website, DiceTower.com, which has all the different podcasts and when they come out. But we will be doing reviews this week. One of the ones we'll be doing is we'll be taking a look at the second edition of Viticulture plus the new expansion for it, Tuscany. We'll be taking a look at the deluxe version of Small World and then a whole pile of smaller games. we got Harbor and we got um, Do Re Mi and the little game from Fancy Flight, Star Wars, Empire vs. Rebellion and Burger Builder and Pirates, Ninjas, Robots and Zombies. Then we got Dungeon Dwellers and then this game, Quilt Show. So all that should be coming out. Uh, we'll also have uh, another board game blender coming out this week for you. So lots of different content for you. Stay tuned and let's keep going on. Oh, hi. Chaz Marler from Pair of Dice Paradise here. And when I'm spending an entire Wednesday waiting on a phone call, I find that there's no better way to manage the monotony of minutes than by methodically combing through my board game collection and cleaning up components. Haha, <laughs> components! Whether they're meeples, movers, money, minis, cards, cardboard, counters, or coins, they're the f f Sorry, deja vu. When tidying up piles of playing pieces, the first approach that I like to take is to move bits into bags. So, let's talk about plastic bags, since nobody else ever has. As long as you ignore Jared Whitley's segment on this very topic from Board Game Breakfast episode number 64. The sandwich bag is the gamer's best friend. Which I am. I am ignoring that. Prior to entering the board game hobby, I couldn't have told you the difference between an everyday Ziploc sandwich bag and a 9-inch Echo Clear low-density ethylene lay-flat poly. <laughs> I know, right? <laughs> but it's true. Not all plastic bags are created equal. What's the difference, you probably didn't just ask. Well, since I'm not currently tied up on the phone, I guess I have time to elaborate. One indicator of a plastic bag's quality is its thickness, measured in something called mil. Common thicknesses are 1, 2, and 4 mil. 1 mil bags are a flimsy embarrassment to the industry, and when I find a game that comes with a 1 mil bag, I drop whatever I'm doing and ridicule them immediately. 2 mil bags are mid-grade, and they're what most games include, and most craft stores sell these. They're the world's most common bag after paper grocery. But my favorite type of bag is 4 mil bags, which, compared to 2 mil bags, are slightly, but noticeably, thicker. It's the type of thing that, once you start looking for it, you never go back to 2 mil bags. Oh no. Uh-uh. Mm -mm -mm. No. And so, after making the decision to become an insufferable component baggy snob, a problem I discovered is that the only place I've been able to consistently find 4 mil bags is online, such as at uline.com, where they're typically sold in batches of a thousand. So, they may not be worth the investment, unless you have a really large board game collection, or if you have a friend who's also into board games, from whom you can permanently borrow a bunch of them at a time when he's not looking. Please note, Pair of Dice Paradise does not endorse stealing from your friends, nor does it endorse not returning phone calls on Wednesday. Hey, we're talking about five more expansions. Great expansions. I'm going through my top 100 list. So let's get started. First with a standalone slash expansion for the game Trains, Trains Rising Sun. Now Trains Rising Sun is a game, uh, Trains was like a Dominion with a board. And I was so enamored with Trains when I first played it that I said it would replace Dominion at some point. And then I said, you know, maybe with the expansions. Well, 
The expansion Rising Sun, first of all, took a while to come out and didn't like set the world on fire. It's, it's good and it does change a lot about trains and I like it a lot, but it still hasn't replaced Dominion. But what Trains Rising Sun did, first of all, added a whole lot more cards, which was great. But then it also added ways if you connected certain things on the board, you got points for doing that, which kind of gave you some purpose and brought the board into more of a intrigual part of the game. So uh, I, I like it very much. That's why it's on the list. The next one we have here is the Eastern Front expansion for Memoir 44. Now, Memoir 44 has a lot of expansions, but I really enjoy the Eastern Front. First of all, um, I, that's just a front that's very interesting to me, the Russians versus the Germans, and bringing the Russian army, and this brought in all the different pieces, so you had to, it wasn't just Americans versus Germans all the time. And there was a lot of tank warfare involved in the Eastern Front, and tanks are my favorite part of Memoir 44, so to be able to take tanks against tanks and some of the overlord scenarios in the Eastern Front, like massive tank battles, was just really fun to me. Or even just some really cool, um, it, it made for a better game. And so that's why I like Eastern Front. Speaking of expansions to Richard Board Games, we have the Call to Arms Battle Lore expansion. Now, I think this one's important for a couple reasons. One is I don't even play Battle Lore anymore. I play the, the second edition of Battle Lore, but I think Battle Lore Call to Arms was kind of an innovative idea for expansions. It allowed you to take cards, putting these cards together to build scenarios. Uh, to, it, it gave you a way to deck build or to army build um, for your army in a very small, innovative package. I was really excited when I got this one. I rated it very highly because it changed the game for me. And now a lot of the changes that came out in the Call to Arms are integrated right into the original uh, Battle Lore game. And we see that maybe in other games, but I think it's, it's still, it's a really cool idea. It wasn't just a point system, but it used cards to determine what your forces were. Then we have Yakuza for cash and guns. Uh, a game where you have these little foam guns, a very exciting game. Then it gives you samurai swords and then throwing stars, which you actually throw at players' character cards. Wow. In fact, I'm still waiting for this expansion to come out for the new second edition of Cash and Guns. This also introduced the team aspect of Cash and Guns where people were on teams. Uh, as you went around the table, the swords felt different than the guns because you could only go to the person next to you, but if they ducked or missed, you'd hit the person after them. So some entertaining and it also allowed you to play more players in Cash and Guns. And finally today we have the On the Brink expansion for Pandemic. Now, Pandemic is an interesting game. I think it's quite fine on its own. And there's a lot of things in On the Brink that I don't ever use. I don't ever use the, uh, uh, the saboteur, the, the guy who's going around and making viruses all over the world. I don't, I don't use that. And, and the extra mutated viruses, I use them sometimes, and they're interesting. But the thing that just really got me excited was all the new roles. There's just so many new roles now. So when you were playing the original game, it was basically, what role are we not using today? Now, there's a whole pile of different things that players can be. And so it felt like it increased the combinations of Pandemic tenfold. And I really thought that was a lot of fun and just breathed a lot of variability into the game. Okay. We're getting higher and higher on this list. See you guys next week. In a world of Catan and Monopoly movies, two men dared to pitch better big screen board games. We love dystopian movies. Movies like Handmaid's Tale, Fahrenheit 451, and The Hunger Games. That sounds a little depressing, all of those, really. So why do we like these movies anyway? Good question. Euphoria <laughs> is a worker placement game where the players are trying to wrest control of their society from their oppressors. A Euphoria movie would contain four separate narratives that all come together at the end, like the movie Crash or any episode of Seinfeld. Each narrative would focus on a character from one of the four allegiances in Euphoria. The Euphorians and their golden city segregate themselves from the rest of the world. The Subterrans are isolated in their underground cave network. The Wastelanders scrape and toil to farm food from the blasted lands. And the mysterious Icarites float above in their zeppelins, collecting the drug Bliss. The Euphorian character is played by Sam Claflin from Catching Fire, who is the youngest son from an elite family in the city. The Subterran character, played by Maisie Williams from Game of Thrones, comes from an engineering family that has been seeking to infiltrate the city. The Wastelander is played by Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad, who has been gathering artifacts from the world that was. Finally, the Icarite, played by Ellen Page from X-Men, is working to overcome her addiction to bliss. In each of their narratives, some unknown benefactor provides information about the true horrors of Euphoria and its factions. 
The leader of the Euphorian Society is played by Serene McKellen, and he makes appearances in all four narratives, opposing the main characters. Eventually, the four escape the control of their individual factions. By the end of the movie, the mysterious benefactor leads the four beyond the edge of Euphoria, the Forbidden Lands. She reveals herself, and is played by Glenn Close, and says, Welcome to the Revolution. Sequel! Here's the tagline, Euphoria, ignorance is bliss, knowledge is death. Is this a movie you'd like to see? Would you cast it differently? Let us know in the comments below. Until next time, we're the Dukes of Dice. Hi, Suzanne here with this week's featured board game app. When Card Crawl released, I heard it was a combo of a deck builder and a dungeon delve, which sounded awesome. But in reality, it's really more of a fantasy dungeon-themed solitaire game, but one I think board gamers might enjoy. So let's take a quick look at this iOS app. In Card Crawl, you have to clear the dealer's deck of 54 cards to win the game before you lose your hit points. The deck has weapons, healing potions, shields, and spells, along with a bunch of different enemies. Four cards get dealt each round, and you have three card slots to manage those cards, thematically two hands and a backpack. The deck is static, but you can earn coins to purchase new spell cards, allowing you to customize up to five cards in the deck. It's a small amount of customization, but perhaps fitting for the quickness and simplicity of the game. Card Crawl is a lovely app with great art and a user-friendly interface. There's a guided tutorial that'll teach you the game, but no rule summary anywhere. As a solitaire game, there's no multiplayer, but you can compare scores and rankings via Game Center. The deck crafting is fun, and keep in mind, all the cards you unlock, you do so in-game. There's no in-app purchases. During early plays, I actually lost a lot, because there's that randomness of the deal. If you get too many big enemies up front, you're basically hosed, which isn't such a big deal because games just take a few minutes to play. But after you grind through a few games and start unlocking the more powerful cards, wins flow more easily, and it becomes more about maximizing points eventually. Make no mistake, this is a light, light game. It's basically themed solitaire with some nice production values. But if you have just a couple of minutes to kill, I like this app and I suggest you give it a try. Hey folks, Kickstarter is obviously a big part of our industry. There's so much news and things that come out of Kickstarter. And this past week I saw a couple projects that I wanted to go into more detail and this may be why Nick didn't mention them. Uh, because I told him I wanted to talk about them. The first are a couple of joke projects. From Asmodee slash Foam Brain Games, we saw a game called Meow, which is kind of like a Are You the Werewolf game, but it was just, it was, I mean, they basically said, this is a joke game, put it up for a few days, raised a couple thousand dollars, and that was it. And the other ones came from the Greater Than Games folks uh, slash Dice Hate Me, where they made deck building, the deck building game, and Ub Pub, a game about publishing games, where they said, these games are a joke. Well, they're not really a joke, but they're a joke, haha, -ha, but it's not a joke. And of course, those games are funding too. Um, and this is something that's always mind boggled me, I guess, about Kickstarter, is the fact that everything seems to go through. I mean, if you have any sort of uh, fans or any sort of people, then your stuff gets uh, goes through. But I, I don't really have any strong opinions on these joke games one way or the other. I just find them very odd, and I'd be curious to get what people's thoughts on them are. I I, I get the ha-ha of jokes and such. I just find it odd that people would throw money at a joke. And then if it isn't a joke, if it's an actual real game, then why call it a joke? It's just a very confusing mess to me. And this is interesting to me because... This, this speculative nature of Kickstarter, okay? And people are saying, well, they said it's a joke, but it might be a really cool game. Now, I'm on the, we're on the other side of Kickstarter at this point, right? We're seeing the games come in from Kickstarter, and we are seeing some absolutely fantastic games come from Kickstarter. Ooh, okay? But, we're, but that is still, for me, in the very small percentage of Kickstarter release games. Most Kickstarter games that I've been getting lately have fallen into the realm of, well, this could have been better, but there's a lot of problems here. It wasn't developed here. This is a problem here. Some have fallen into the category of, oh, it's so horrible. Look at the big fix, which I did last review I did last week. And there is more of those coming, folks. Just really bad games. Um, I know that publishers have published really bad games in the past, but nothing as bad as some of these Kickstarter projects. Now, that being said, there are some great stuff coming out from Kickstarter, but you almost have to kind of keep afloat. But the fact is, 
is that Kickstarter is a speculative thing. When you go to a Kickstarter project, you are saying, I hope it's good. And the more information they give you, the better you can say, oh, I'll back this or not. Uh, take, for example, Dwarven Forge. Just finished their Kickstarter last week. Um, and the previous two Dwarven Forge Kickstarters gave tons of really high quality, really good looking terrain. You got a really good value for your money. And so this one went over a couple million dollars or so. And, and for good reason, because they have a proven track record. Therefore, it's not so speculative. But at the same time, some companies that did have a good proven track record can, can go out of business. The, the fifth level games, they went out of business. The, they declared bankruptcy and they had put out several games that they seemingly had a good track record. So you you, ha you know, it's, it's not gambling per se, but it's very similar in many respects, I think, to the stock market. Uh, so you just have to use your best resources. And there's lots of resources out there. And I don't think it's wrong to kickstart a game. I think there's a lot of good aspects to it. Um, and there are games that I've kickstarted because I'm interested in seeing the final product. But when we look at this uh, uh, Kickstarter that was launched last week, the Titan, uh, the Titan game series from Calliope Games. In fact, uh, as a caveat, they are... Uh, currently advertising on the Dice Tower website. But when I look at this, and I sat down and talked to Ray Weirs from Calliope Games about this a long time at Gamma Trade Show, I'm very intrigued with the, the idea, but it's extremely speculative. Um, essentially, what, he's, what they're doing with this uh, Kickstarter is they're releasing nine games over a series of three years. Three games come out a year. You are kickstarting the whole shebang now for a fairly inexpensive price for all nine games, okay? Um, it's uh, somewhere between $100 dollars um, to get nine games, which is a pretty good deal. The thing is, at this point in time, we know nothing about these games other than the designers. And this is where they're really trying to um, you know, get points here because the designers are Richard Garfield and Eric Lang and Jordan Wiseman and uh, Mike Slinker and James Ernest and, you know, there's several big name designers. Now, a few of these designers are not board game designers. They are miniatures designers and things like that. And so uh, I don't know that that always cross genre designing is not a skill that everybody has, but whatever. Some of the designers are very, you know, Rob Davio, wow, you know, he's made some great games, Eric Lang, wow, okay, and so it can be very exciting about, about this, and so this Kickstarter is basically saying, do you like these designers? Then buy a game, sight unseen, from them, it's probably going to be good. <laughs> well, that's very interesting. Um, we, again, we don't know anything except the Richard Garfield game uh, he's mentioned. Sounds like a reworking of a What Were You Thinking party game that he put out a while ago in which you have to write down lists of, of things and you're trying to match other people's lists of things. It's a fun party game uh, that's been out uh, for a while and so he's redoing that. These are gateway games, games that help get people into the industry, light games. Will this succeed? Well, at the time of re-recording this, it's trundling its way along there. It didn't explode. It didn't fund in the first couple days. So the first week, and it's not funded yet, but because it's being, uh, it's going to be funded for 60 days, I, there's, I, I can't fathom how it will not cross the finish line. Okay, it's going to fund. But how is it going to work? I, when I talked to Ray about this, I mentioned uh, a, a series of games that came out before. It was in one box called Stonehenge. And if you guys have never heard of Stonehenge, you should go check it out. It's a game that had like hot designers, Richard Borg and the other great designers all put their games in one box. And you had these components, you could play five different games with it. And it was horrible. Um, the, none of the games were very good. Some of them were just downright bad. It was a major, major flop, okay? I don't know almost anybody who liked it, uh, but it had such hype behind it because of the designers that were behind it. Now, there's a couple problems with uh, Stonehenge. First of all, it had a single set of components that everybody had to use. And that's just problematic and bad in itself. This does not have it. The Titan series does not have that. They're going to be complete games. But they're still asking consumers to basically say, I think they'll be good. That's it. Are you willing to put money behind that you think they'll be good? Now you'll say, Vassal, but this is a good idea because I can put money into these games. I, I can, you know, I do this and I'm getting these games. It's a subscription service. It's pretty cool. Three games will show up each year. I don't know what they are. And maybe some will be bad. Some will be mediocre. Some will be good, but it will even out. That's true. But let's say some are bad, some are mediocre, and some are great. 
you could probably save money by just waiting for the great ones to come out and buy them, thus saving you shelf space and having to get these other games. Now, I'm not telling you not to back the Kickstarter. I think it's, it's really up to you, and I would love to hear in the comments what you think about backing this Kickstarter, whether it's worth it to you or not. Do these designer names carry the weight that covers up the lack of all the rest of the information? Because they're not telling you anything about the game, showing you any of the components. They're basically saying just trust the designer, which is really interesting because we've kind of come full circle in that. You know, back to where we used to have a hard time even getting a designer's name on a box. Now, the designer name is put out there, but no box. Buy the game anyway. So, I don't know. Uh, it, it, it's, it's a new thing for Kickstarter. Some are calling this, like, you know, exploiting the customers. I, 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 don't, I don't think it's that. I, I don't think anyone's going into this with uh, anything less than noble intentions. I think they plan to put out good games. But great designers don't always put out good games. Every designer on that great designer list, I can point to several or other games, or at least one game for each of them, and say, you yeah, know, that game's not very good. Hmm. Hmm. <laughs> anyway, let me know in the comments what you think about these joke Kickstarter games and then this speculativeness of Kickstarter. Greetings, friends, and Baylor Margolis. Chances are a lot of you are awaiting this upcoming Sunday, which is the season premiere of Game of Thrones. Now, if you're a board game person and you have friends who like the show, chances are they will ask you to play a game set in Westeros at some point. And I would tell you right now, you do not have good options for this. For as many licensed properties as there are connected to things like Star Wars and Lord of the Rings, there really isn't a lot for Game of Thrones. You've really only got three choices. The most famous is the Fantasy Flight War game. It's been in the people's choice all four years, hovering somewhere around the 30s and 40s each time. Production values are great, the theme comes through really strong, and Fantasy Flight has great online resources for it. In a Game of Thrones, the board game, three to six players take on the roles of the great houses of Westeros. Your other option is the living card game, which has all the advantages of a good LCG, but also all the disadvantages. You see, neither of these games is particularly good for what your casual Game of Thrones watching public want which is a lightweight, fast game. These two games are really heavy and really involved, which can scare some people away, especially the war game. I had some friends recently try to play it and had a terrible time with it, as this text exchange shows. Recognizing this, Fantasy Flight Games recently introduced Game of Thrones Westeros Intrigue, which is a game so simple that Reiner Knizia probably came up with it on a long bus ride. Much as I like the game, it's a little too light for repeat play. I would weigh it somewhere below Ticket to Ride and somewhere above Tic-Tac-Toe. Honestly, it doesn't work as well for a game to introduce to people who already love the show as it works as a tool to introduce the show to people who don't know the characters yet. So what's your best option? Well, that's what we'll discuss next week. In the meantime, enjoy Game of Thrones Season 5. And as we say in the Dice Tower, when you played the game of the Game of Thrones... Great components? Yeah! I got them! Hi, I'm Ian from Open Box Games Jr. And welcome to Component Moon. And today we're going to take a look at Garden. So let's open the box. The point of the game is to capture all of your opponents in walls. And it comes with a board that has little gaps to place walls in. You have a hand of cards. Playing different cards lets you place walls and move spaces. But be careful. Don't let your opponents trap you. And it has a whole other side of the board for a whole new version. Ah! It got me! Oh, dear. This Saturday is International Tabletop Day. Awesome! Join me and my friends from Geekcraft this Saturday at Great Lakes Game Emporium. Happy Easter. See you this Saturday. Bye! Hey folks, that's the end of another show. Now, uh, one more announcement before we end. Uh, there will be no live Q&A this week because the computer that does the Q&A is in the shop right now. Not <coughs> kids. Um, but anyhow, 
uh, when that after that's fixed, we'll we'll get back to some more uh, live stuff. Uh, if you missed it, we did a live uh, playing through the Imperial Assault Tactical Skirmish game last week. Uh, so there's that to watch and lots of other things. Lots of great content coming this week, folks. Until next time, I'm Tom Vassell, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast. Thanks for watching Board Game Breakfast. Tune in each week for your daily dose of gaming goodness with Tom Vassell and all the gang. Until next time, I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching Board Game Breakfast, a Dice Tower production. Sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., an amazing place to buy board games. Cool stuff in stock at CoolStuffInc.com.